we are getting ready to do another lab together, and guess what? This is probably one of the easiest labs ever, folks. Whenever I see Soxlet, quite honestly, I look at Soxlet and say to myself, Oh, this is going to be a super easy lab experiment because there's very little thing that I have to do with a Soxlet extractor. So that's what you're going to see in this video. Very few things that I actually had to do on my end in order for this lab to go forward. So what exactly did I have to do? Well, let's take a look at it, shall we? So the very first thing that I did, this lab is concerning peanuts, and I went to the grocery store and I purchased some peanuts. And these peanuts actually came from the food line in Leland. All right, so I paid $1.99 for this bag of peanuts. I wanted to make sure, though, number one, that they were raw. Okay, so right here at the very bottom, raw peanuts. They have not been roasted. They have not been salted. They are just basically plucked, put into a bag, and sold to me as a consumer. All right, so it's going to be my job to go in and extract peanut oil from these peanuts that you see in this bag. On the inside of those peanuts, we have oil, of course, right? And maybe Chick-fil-A wants to buy that peanut oil to fry their stuff in. Well, okay, we're going to have to be able to get the oil some way, some form, some fashion. And a Soxlet extractor is going to allow that to happen on a small scale for us. So the first thing that I did is open up the bag, of course, and I took out the peanuts, and that's what you're seeing here in the picture, and I needed to take, of course, the shell off. So I cracked all the peanuts one by one. I just pretended like I was Texas Roadhouse, or maybe Five Guys, and I just started deshelling the peanuts off. Now, here's the problem. When you deshell the peanut, you also have the skin that's around the peanut as well. And we need that skin off, but I'm not going to worry about that yet. I'm just going to take a handful of nuts. I'm going to crack them open. I'm just going to lay them over to the side. And sooner or later, I'm going to have to take the skin off the peanuts, and that's what you see over on the left, and I'm going to have to strip them, strip them, folks, make them go naked. And that's what you see over on the right-hand side. Well, I'm not done with the peanuts yet. They are now naked. They're ready for my jacuzzi bath of the Soxlet extractor. But before I do that, I'm going to have to chop them up. I'm going to have to put them in little bitty pieces so I can increase the surface area of the piece and be able to extract the oil a little bit better. All right, so here's a video of ba basically me doing all the dirty work in the laboratory I had to take the bag of peanuts in and do all this manual labor. Who signed me up for this? So let's take a look at this process. Okay, so here's my peanuts. And I've just cracked open the shells right there. You see a mound of peanuts that are here. I'm probably going to have to have more than this, actually. But this is a good place to start. But the problem with this process is that the skin it's got to be removed, people. I've got to be able to get the skin off. So I just give it a good rub, and the skins come off. I throw the skins away, and then over here on this side, you're going to see not only my Dunkin' Donuts cup in the back, which is a no-no in a lab, but it's okay. It's just me, and it's just peanuts. But here in this pile, that is where my good peanuts are going to go that I'm going to then chop, 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 chop. So over this process, it's going to take me about 30 minutes, I guess, before I can get these prepped. And you'll see how much we weigh out in the very end. All right, so this process took me about 30 minutes to do. It wasn't bad. I shouldn't be complaining about it, but it was very aggravating. As you can imagine, some of these skins were very easy to come off and others were very stubborn, almost to the point that I just trashed the nut. I threw it in the trash can. I said, you're no good. I can't de-skin you, so I've got no purpose in you. And away it went, and I just cracked off another one. All right, so the chopped nuts were chopped, of course, and I probably should have chopped them into smaller pieces 
than what you're seeing on your screen right now. But at the same time, I just didn't really have the patience for it, folks. And I know that's a bad no-no on my end, but if you were doing this and someone gave you the job to chop these nuts up, then I would probably suggest to go a little bit smaller because the larger these nut chunks are, the longer the oxalate is going to take. All right, so that's the problem here. All right, but we'll see how this turns out. Maybe my lab data will be beautiful. Maybe it will be perfect in the very end. And maybe it will be crappy. I just don't know, but we'll go with it. All right, so I go to the balance. The lab directions are going to tell me the very first thing that I need to do is calculate the percent of water. So the way that we do that is I go to the balance, I hit the tear button, I make sure all the doors are closed like usual, my balance reads 0 0.0000, and then I'm going to take a Petri dish. The reason I take a Petri dish is because it's glass, and there is an edge all the way around the Petri dish so that the nut chunks will not just fall off of a watch glass, right? This is going to keep it contained, and that's exactly what I want. All right, so I'm going to take the mass of the Petri dish, and I get 38.8895. Well, now I'm going to add the chopped nuts that I took all that time to deshell and de-skin and to chop into a small piece. And the teared Petri dish, the teared Petri dish was 0, 0.00. I don't have a picture of that. So this mass is just for the nuts. So keep that in mind. So 40.9913 is the mass of the nuts that are in that Petri dish. So that Petri dish from before, that Petri dish was teared out. I just skipped the picture. All right. Okay, so now we need to calculate the percent of water. So what I do is I go to one of our ovens, I open up the oven door, I put that Petri dish with all of my peanuts in the oven. Uh, as you can see, nothing else was in that oven, really. I kept it pretty clean. I was proud of myself for that day. And I turn the oven on, and the setting here, you can write down that setting. I mean, you write down what you can see. I don't have to tell you what that setting is supposed to be. And that temperature of that particular oven was running about here the entire time that I was there. So again, you can read a thermometer. I don't have to tell you what that is. You can make your observation and write it down in your lab notebook. So on June the 30th at 1.45 p.m., that is when the nuts went inside of the oven, and that is when the drying time began. All right, so here's a close-up of all of those beautiful peanuts that were chopped that went inside of the oven. All right, so this is before they dried. This is the raw peanut chopped and placed in the oven at that time. Okay, so now that the ovens or the nuts are in the oven, now that they're kind of roasting on me and I'm evaporating some of that water off, I then turn toward the setup of the soxalate. And this is going to require a few pieces. Number one, a Florence flask is going to be chosen. Now, the Florence flask here is a 250 mil Florence flask, and the Florence flask is because it's flat on the bottom. This is not a round bottom flask, folks. A round bottom would be perfectly round on the bottom. That's why they call it a round bottom. Can you imagine? But this is a Florence flask instead. All right, I'm also going to need a Soxalate adapter, and this is what the Soxalate adapter is going to look like. So, as you probably saw in some of the videos, the vapor will come up through the soxalate chamber, it will divert over to the side, and the vapor will come through the side arm of the soxalate, and it will come into the soxalate from the top. The condenser is going to cool the vapor back down, and this liquid will begin to fill up in the soxalate until I get to the top of that small elbow, that kind of nook that's happening right there. When that does, all of my liquid rushes out and it will self-drain itself and it will come back down into the fulling flask that's down below, or my Florence flask in this case. All right. 
So in the next picture, I have this Soxalate condenser, and the Soxalate condenser will condense, go figure, right? So cold water will constantly rush through this Soxalate condenser, and this is what changes the vapor into a liquid, so that way that liquid can go into the vat, where my thimble will end up being that will hold the peanuts in the Soxalate extractor. I'm also going to constantly stir this material as well. This is going to have a very long extraction period. And I don't want anything to char, I don't want anything to burn, so because of that, I'm going to put a magnet in my boiling flask, because we're better than little bowling chips. We invest the money into magnets to improve your education and give you the best possible around. So here's my little magnet that I'm going to put into the Florence flask. Alright, so I'm going to go back to the balance, and guess what? I tear it! 0, 0.0000 grams. And then I'm going to take, eh, eh, not a bowling flask, but a Florence flask. Look at me, I'm already making a mistake. So I'm going to take my Florence flask, and then I'm going to add it onto my balance. Uh, that also includes my magnet, by the way. Do you see that in there? My magnet is present. And this is 161.5147. So a teared balance with the Florence flask and the magnet. 161.5147. All right, so now I'm going to get a Soxalate thimble. All right, just like the thimble that goes on your thumb when you're sewing, it kind of helps protect your thumb, right? So this is going to, in a way, help protect our sample. It's going to give us our little capsule that our peanuts are going to go down on the inside, and this keeps everything nice and tidy in the Soxalate extractor, so it doesn't get messy, and it doesn't jar up the drainage tubing and stuff, so forth, on the side of the Soxalate. So that's why we use the thimbles. Some people do not. Maybe in some of those videos that you watched, they did not use any thimbles, and they just crammed their material down into a Soxalate extractor. Okay, well that's great, whatever, whatever floats their boat. But I'm not going to take the chance of looking at this Soxalate extractor and having little small chunks that basically build up in this very narrow tubing. And it can happen anywhere. So why am I going to take that? This piece of glassware is expensive. And how am I going to clean all of that mess out if it does venture in there and get lodged or jammed? So that is the purpose of the thimble, and that's why we use them. So this is what the side of the thimble looks like. It is very porous. Think of it almost like a piece of filter paper. And then here's the inside of the thimble looking down from the top. So I need to go back to the balance. I'm going to tear it out once more. And now I'm just going to get the mass of the thimble only. That's all that's here, just the thimble, and that's 2.3047 gram. Well, I also like to have a little top, a little cap onto my thimble. And the reason that I do this is to prevent stuff from floating up and out. If I'm going to take the time to do a thimble just to ensure that things do not get lodged up into the extractor, then I want to make sure that I take the time to put a cap on it so little small particulate pieces do not float up and out of the Soxalate thimble. All right, so that's the purpose of the cotton. I'm going to end up putting the cotton in the thimble at a certain point. So I need the mass of the cotton too. So the mass of the cotton, 0 0.7566 grams. Well, as you can imagine, all of these pieces have to be connected. Therefore, I do need T-clips and I need these glassware clips that will connect everything together and hold everything in place. All right, now let's talk about reagents. What are the reagents that I need for this lab experiment? How complicated is this going to get, Tracy? Uh, it doesn't really get complicated at all. And that's because you only need one thing. That's it. Petroleum ether. We call it PET ether for short. And there's two different versions of PET ether. There is a low boiling point and there is a high boiling point. All right? So out of the low and the high boiling points, here's the deal. If they have the same solubility and I'm using it as a solvent, then I want to make sure that I'm picking the low boiling point version because I will not have to put a lot of heat onto a low boiling point solvent to evaporate it off. And I will not run the risk of burning or charring my product in the very end.
If I choose the high boiling points, so that might be great. It might extract that oil just like the low one does. But the problem is that I have to put more heat onto the high version. And that more heat could possibly run the chances of charring my product a little bit more than the lower boiling point one. So what I've chosen here is the low boiling point ethers. And if you look, 40 to 60 is going to be the boiling point range. All right. Okay, so the lot number is also here. Acros Organics is the manufacturer of this pet ether that we're using today. So A0389387. There we go. So, of course, the higher boiling point ether, the high boiling point ethers will go higher than 60, right? And petroleum ether is just like petroleum. It's a mixture of different organic molecules that are all thrown together. And these are mainly ethers. All right, so petroleum ether are ether functional groups, and they are a mixture of different ethers. And that mixture of different ethers, it's like alphabet soup, all have boiling points that are in the range of 40 to 60 degrees. That is what petroleum ether is. So there is no one set structure that you can draw for petroleum ether. All right, so now that we do this, I've got my petroleum ether. I come back on a different day, 7-1. I take the nuts out of the oven, and I take the nuts out of the oven at 2.22 p.m. So you can time and date it. And the mass of the nuts and the Petri dish, 77.1237. So keep in mind that mass is for both the nut and the Petri dish. All right, so now I'm going to go and I'm going to tear out the thimble. So I'll just put it into a beaker so that way it can hold it upright. So I've teared out the beaker weight and the thimble weight. And I decided to add some of those dried nuts into the thimble. How much? Well, I added 20.125 grams worth of nuts into that thimble. So I begin to stop here. Begin to stop. That didn't make any sense. I stopped there. And then I picked up the thimble. I took a picture from the top view so you can see what those nuts look like on the inside of that thimble. And then I placed my little cotton cap on top of it. Nice and tidy. Keep it clean. And then that thimble with the cotton and the nuts went inside of the Soxalate extractor. How do you know if you are choosing the appropriate thimble size? Well, the top of the thimble normally comes to the top of that elbow right there. Okay, And here, mine doesn't. It goes up a little bit higher, but that's okay. As long as the nuts that are on the inside of this thimble are be is below that elbow, then I'm okay. And that's really what I watch out for. All right, so in this video, I'm going to show you the setup in a visual, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about the setup. Okay, so this is the setup for the Soxalid extraction for my peanuts. And what I have here is a 250 milliliter Florence flask. It's Florence because it has a flat bottom and I'm putting it onto the surface of a flat hot plate. So this is not a true round bottom flask. So all of my ether or my extraction solvent will go into this flask and it will begin to heat up. As the solvent heats up, it's going to go up through the neck of the Florence flask and it's going to come into the actual soxalate extractor, which is what's next. All right, so the vapors are going to travel up through the neck and back into this area of the soxalate extractor. In this area is my thimble. This will hold my peanuts and a piece of cotton at the top. It's already in my soxalate, so it's ready to go. And the ether, if it gets too hot, will try to escape and it will go up into this part of the soxlet, which will hit a cold condenser. So this condenser will help send my ether back down into the soxlet, which is right here. This will slowly fill more and more and more and more and more until it gets to the top of that neck. 
Then when my liquid level gets to that point, it will self drain itself. So all of this ether that has been soaking my peanuts will now be drained automatically and it will be sent through that piece of tubing and back down into my Florence flask that sits below. And this process is going to repeat over and over and over. All right, so top of that neck. Then when my liquid level gets to that point, it will self drain itself. So all of this ether that has been soaking my peanuts will now be drained automatically and it will be sent through that piece of tubing and back down into my Florence flask that sits below. And this process is going to repeat over and over and over. All right, so as a whole, this is what the Soxlet extraction looks like. Very simple design, not too many pieces and parts that go into it, but folks, there you go. There's the Soxlet put together as a whole. Okay, so there you go. You know what to write in your lab book at this point. If you like a steel pitcher, then this is what this is for, right here to the left. All right, so if I look at that piece, I need to label each and every one of those pieces into a lab notebook so people know what to put together and how this thing gets set up. Keep in mind the water in and the water out. That's also very important, like it is every single time that we use a reflux condenser. So right now, the only thing that's here are my peanuts, and I need to put my extraction solvent in. Notice I did not do that in the beginning, though, and here's the reason. I like to pour my extraction solvent from the top of the condenser, and I like to let it fill the Soxlet extractor. When it fills the Soxlet extractor, it will drain, and then I allow it to fill again for a second time. This way, I can ensure that I have enough solvent in this system to really do what we call a rollover, and that is the draining of an extraction solvent. So I've got my petroleum ether here in a beaker. I'm pouring it through the top with the help of a funnel, and it's going through my reflux condenser, and it's filling up that thimble so that way I can actually watch it drain. Okay, so what I'm getting ready to do, I'm going to pour some of this petroleum ether into the Soxlet chamber. You're going to see that liquid slowly fill up in, in that area, and I want you to watch the drain that, that happens. So I'm going to fill this up enough so that two drains, two full drains, will actually go on. Uh, so that looks like it just rolled over a little bit too early, uh, so I'm going to wait until that stops. And now it has, you can see all of that liquid kind of went down to the bottom. And I'm going to pour a little bit more of that petroleum ether in, and I'm going to let it fill up. And there you're seeing it fill up, and it's going to drain at this point. All right, so I have filled this 250 ml boiling flask with about halfway, I'm going to say at least 175, 150 milliliters at this point, if not more. So this is where I'm going to start. I'm just going to cut on the heat. There we go. And I'll let this petroleum ether just start doing its thing. Okay, so I'm going to come back two days later. Two days, that's right. That's how long this process starts. And I'm going to keep checking on my ether layers to make sure that it is full and that more can still go into the Soxlet from up above. Okay, so that was the really difficult task of filling up a Soxlet extractor. Ha ha ha, give me a break, right? All right, so what, I mean, please, they tell me to do this in a job? And this is all that I have to do when I get paid? Well, yeah, that's kind of what goes on, especially in environmental work, which is where you see this most often. All right, so here is the picture of the Soxlet extractor. I'm filling the petroleum ether into this extractor. 
Uh, as you can tell from, maybe you can't tell it, but if you look at this picture really closely, you can maybe see a little bit of liquid layer that's here. And then sooner or later, it's going to go to the top of that elbow. When it gets to the top of the elbow, you're seeing that liquid level right there. It's going to eventually drain, and it will automatically dispense down into the Florence flask that sits below. And that's what you're seeing there in that picture. Just basically what I showed you in the video just now. So I do that twice, again, just to help ensure that I do put enough solvent in here because the last thing that I want is to heat this flask up and all of the solvent be up here in the thimble extractor, the soxalate extractor, and no more solvent down here to fill this up with. Then the whole process stops. The only thing I'm doing is heating up an empty Florence flask at that time, right? And that doesn't make any sense. So this helps me ensure that I do have enough solvent in the Soxalate extractor so that way it will be automated and it will extract for hours and hours and hours without me worrying about it. All right, so there's the solvent level. I told you in the video how much I probably used estimated version-wise, and then I crank the heat on. So we need to heat this solvent up, right? We need to turn it to a vapor. We need to have it go up and over and drip down into the soxalate. And that's what we're going to see here. So this is the boiling flask with my petroleum ether, really a Florence flask. It's just now beginning to boil. So I've recorded that time down. And if I notice from the neck of the flask, I'm starting to see a few drips that are happening. However, I haven't yet seen those drips in the actual Soxlet. Uh, that ether still has not made its way into the thimble area yet where my peanuts are. So I recorded this time down so that way we'll have it in our lab notebook. Uh, up here at the very top, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, here is the Soxlet with the thimble. And if this ether has made its way to this area, I would start seeing some drops here, and I don't. So uh, I might see a little residual one off of this thing right now, but that's due to the uh, liquid that I poured in through the top, not from the evaporation from what's down below. Uh, that would happen much quicker. Okay, so I'm just gonna continue to wait, and I'm gonna write down the time of which I see the very first drop into the soxalate chamber. And again, this is where my peanuts are going to be located, and my peanuts need a bath, and that bath is going to be my petroleum ether that I'm using from down below. Okay, so here's a picture or close-up of the ether bowling. You can make observations if you want. If the lab book requires it, then there you go. Nothing fancy or crazy is happening here. It just looks like boiling water, doesn't it? At least it does to me. So again, it's not going to take a lot of heat. This has a low boiling point, 40 to 60. So this is going to boil much cooler than water will at 100. All right, so now I want to show you a rollover. And that's what this video is going to show you here. What is the definition of a rollover, and what does a rollover look like? All right, guys, about 40 minutes into this soxalate extraction, I'm starting to see drips from my soxalate extractor. So this is a very good sign that my ether now is reaching, of course, the upper chambers of the soxalate. All of that ether is getting slowly dripped into the thimble that sits down below. And this is slowly starting to fill up with liquid down here at the very bottom. So once this liquid, right now this is the level, gets up to this neck, this curvature piece, then this thing will fill up and it will automatically drain back down into the Florence flask that sits below. All right, so I'm going to continue to let this go. This is what we call a rollover. When that liquid the solvent gets up to the curvature piece and drains. That is called a rollover. And I'm going to record a couple of rollover times. How long is this process actually taking? It's an important part of the lab book, and I can't forget about it. 
Okay, so I also want to kind of skip back and, and go back two more slides. Uh, notice up here at the top, I do give you a date and time stamp on when I begin to heat it and when I see the first drip in the soxalate extractor. So that will give you an idea of how long this process is actually taking. So back to the rollover, I'm going to show you the rollover in action. So a rollover is about to happen. I can see that the liquid layer is right here and that's right at the neck of this thing. So this is going to be kind of preempting the actual rollover that will begin to happen. Hopefully we can catch this rollover on film because I would want you to show or see the actual rollover that happens in the socks lift at that point. So I'm going to shut up for just a few seconds. We're going to sit here and watch and we're going to see if the rollover begins to happen on camera. And folks, there it goes. There's the drain that's beginning to happen. All of that liquid is getting dumped back down into my flask that sits below. And now that ether is continuing to get heated and fresh petroleum ether is now making its way back up into the Soxlet thimble area. So I'm going to continue this process over and over. I'm going to document the time that that rollover happened and I'm going to keep track of about four or five of these to see if it's too long or if it's too short. So that is what we mean with a rollover in the Soxlet. Okay, so now you see what a rollover actually is. And like I've mentioned before, it's very important in a lab notebook that we record the times that those rollovers begin to happen. And I do have that on an upcoming slide for you. So be ready to write down those times at least because I want to average all of these and say, hey, my average rollover time was blah. So this lets me kind of showcase data uh, allowing someone to know that I did not rush this time extraction through and at the same time I didn't take forever in order for this extraction to happen because the longer it takes the longer I have to let the Soxlet do its job right if it takes too fast and it's I'm not giving the solvent enough time to extract any kind of peanut oil from the peanut then it's really not doing me any good either right so we have a target rollover time for every extraction that we do. And that's typically embedded into the laboratory procedure. All right, so here is the heating. It's going to be continued to heat. And again, it's just a follow-up video with the rollover. So we are about one hour into my socks lid, and I've got many, many more hours to go. Try 16 to 18 more. Yeah, 16 to 18 more hours. I've got to let this thing go on for days. All right, so this is what the temperature setting is doing for my petroleum ether. Notice it is at a full boil at this point. However, this boils at a really low temperature. It's not like boiling water. And that ether is still continuing to climb into my Soxlet that's up here at the top. You can see where my liquid level is right now. It's right here. And then if I look at the Soxlet, you can see how fast it's dripping. At least one drip per second, if not more. All right, so I'm gonna to continue to let this go. I'm gonna to continue to record my rollover times. I'm gonna to continue to see how long it takes for that rollover to happen. And if it's too fast or if it's too slow, I'll fiddle with my temperature setting on my hot plate until I get something that actually works. If you wanna know what that temperature setting is right now, this is what I have it set at. All right, so more observations to record for a lab notebook. Yay! Okay, so as you can tell, the pet ether was getting to my head maybe a little bit. But folks, here's the rollover time. Let me show you those time and date stamps that I extracted from the laboratory to save you the time and effort. And here is that data for you. So rollover times, this is what I recorded. Uh, I don't know if I did as many as the lab directions tell, told me to do, 
but this will be good enough for your purposes and your lab brought up for your notebook. So 344, 355, 408, 417, 429, and 440. This is the ballpark time that those rollovers happened. Okay, so now that you have those rollover times in your notebook, more times for you to write down as well. So on July the 1st, I ran the peanuts from 3.28 p.m. to 8.23 at night. Yes, folks, I went back out there and I turned off that sock slit at 8.23 just to promote your academic success. I did it for you. I did it for you. July the 2nd, 11.32 in the morning to 7.34 in the evening. Once again, popped into the lab, nobody there, kind of creepy. But I sacrificed just for you. And then on July the 3rd, 10.21 a.m. that morning to 8.43 at night, even creepier. The school was probably also asking why I was swapping in at weird random times at night in the evening when nobody was there. All right, so on a brand new day, July the 6th, I come back into the laboratory. This is what the Florence flask looks like. Now, depending on what you're extracting, this solution could turn a color. That's okay. But you can make your observations here. This is after the total extraction period. Then if I take a look at my thimble, this is what was in the thimble. I noticed there's some liquid in here, right? So a lot of people ask, well, what do I do with this liquid? Well, that liquid could possibly have more peanut oil in there for me. I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to ignore it. I don't want to waste it. So what I traditionally do, and again, it depends on your lab procedure, but what I traditionally do is I want to save it and I want to transfer it. So when I take this apart, I now have my Florence flask that's on a hot plate. I'm going to take the Soxalid extractor and I'm going to pour all of that liquid down into this Florence flask that should have the rest of my peanut oil in it. Just in case. Just in case there's more oil that can be found in that last little bit of solvent that was left over. All right, well, my thimble's wet at this point, and I'm going to put that thimble into the oven. All right, so here's what the thimble looks like after the extraction period. I've got a wet thimble. I have wet peanuts. I have a wet piece of cotton. So all of that needs to go into the oven, and it needs to dry. So I put it in the oven on that morning at 10.52 a.m. Now here's the problem. As you can tell, the thimble is kind of a tight fit in that soxalid extractor, right? I mean, I almost picked one that was a little too wide. So I had a kind of a hard time getting this out. So I took a pair of tweezers and I was trying to wiggle, wiggle that thimble out of the extractor. When I did that, I actually ripped a little bit of that thimble up here at the very top. Well, I don't want to throw that piece away because this was weight. It was mass that was assigned to my thimble in the very beginning. And if I do not include that later on, then I'm going to get a wrong number for the mass. And this could cause me a little bit of problem later on down the road. So I just want to keep all of these pieces that did shed off because of my silly decision that I did in the very beginning. All right, so I put that into the oven. Here's the oven setting. Again, you can write that down on your own. And then here's the temperature setting for that particular oven at that temperature. All right, so we'll let this dry. We'll come back to it a little bit later. In the meantime, though, I need to go to what we call our rotary evaporator, or Rotovap for short. So the Rotovap is a piece of equipment in our laboratory, and it's very much like a simple distillation. So what happens is I've got a solution into this flask. This flask is lowered down to a hot water bath or a hot oil bath. You choose which one you want to use. And then that vapor or that liquid will turn into a vapor. That vapor will travel over in this direction. That vapor will go up at a certain point. The reflux will cool that down just like a normal reflux would. And I see some collection over here to the left-hand side. We do this when there's a lot of solvent that we want to keep. 
And if I look at this flask that's here, that flask has quite a bit of solvent in it, right? And that solvent's perfectly good. If I can evaporate that solvent off, because that's all it is, solvent and peanut oil. If I can evaporate that solvent off, and if I can collect it and keep it, I can reuse that solvent for other purposes. Maybe someone else that wants to do a peanut extraction later on. Or maybe pet ether uh, when we have to use it for a different particular lab. As long as I confirm that this is petroleum ether, then I can reuse this for a different purpose at a different time on a different date. So we recycle in the lab. We don't trash everything. We don't evaporate everything off. And here's one of those times where we don't do that. All right, so there's my rotavap. So I need to take this big chunky flask off of here. And I'm going to replace it with my Florence flask that's right there. And I'm just going to attach the clip so that way it doesn't go anywhere. And then I'll start this heating process up. So before I do that, I've got a few videos that I would like to show you about using the rotary evaporator because for many of you this will be the first time that you actually see this in action. Folks this is something that we call a rotary evaporator or a rotavap. So let me touch base on the pieces and parts that make this thing work. Right here we have a water bath and this water bath can either be filled with water, of course, or we can also use oils. If the uh, boiling point is at a really hot temperature, we can choose to put an oil in there instead of water, of course. Uh, the controls to set the temperature of the water bath are here. The control to set how fast this thing will spin uh, is over to the left. Uh, what you see here in this flask is the flask with the petroleum ether and my peanut oil that's getting ready to be evaporated off. The solvent is going to go through the angled part of the rotary evaporator uh, into a reflux condenser that you're seeing right there. And then below the reflux condenser is a collection receiving flask. Uh, so all this is is a very fancy, expensive setup for a distillation. That's all that a rotovap ever is. All right, so the nice thing about it, though, very much automated, which makes me very happy. So I'm getting ready to put my peanut oil into the system and we're going to evaporate off the solvent and collect the peanut oil at the end. Okay, folks, so there's the rota evaporator, rotary evaporator or rota vap. Uh, here's a close up picture of my Florence flask again with my ether and my peanut oil in it. We're going to figure out how much peanut oil is actually here. And uh, in the next picture, you're going to see a couple of settings. The one that I want to focus on first is the water bath temperature, and that's going to be the big knob over on the right hand side of our rotovap. So it's actually attached to the water bath itself. So this is what that screen looks like right now. You can see it's off and it's set at 20 degrees. Notice here's the minimal and there's the maximum temperature that you can set it at. In order to change the number, of course, you just grab a hold of this knob and you turn it left or you turn it right. If you want it on or off, you push the button to turn it on. You push it again to turn it off. It's as simple as that. That's all that you need to do with it. So here's me dialing in to the appropriate temperature for this particular extraction. So I have filled my water bath with water, all right? And the reason I did this is because water is at 100 degrees. My oil has a temperature higher than 100 as far as boiling point, And my petroleum ether has a temperature lower than a 100. So I'm not going to dial this all the way up to 100. I'm going to go close. And I'm going to put this at 95 degrees. So I'm just twisting the dial until you see 95 that shows up on the screen. And then I'll press the button and that will turn this system on. All right, so we'll cut this on. We'll let this heat up to 100 degrees and all of my petroleum ether will begin to go over into the receiving flask. So that was difficult, wasn't it? So hard, so complicated to use. All right, so here over to the left, is going to be an RPM setting. This is another setting that I need to make on the Rotovap instrument. And this is how fast that Florence flask will turn. They call it rotary evaporator because it rotates. It rotates the flask, rotary evaporator. Go figure, who would have thought? So 
I can slow the spinning process down or I can speed the printing uh, spinning process up. Just like before, I use the knob to make the adjustment. I push it to turn it on. I push it to turn it off. Uh, here are the minimal 20 and the maximal 270 settings for the RPM. So the control that you're seeing here is called the uh, RPM control, which is how fast this flask is going to rotate. All right, so right now it's set at 120. If I just push the button and turn this on, you're going to see this flask begin to rotate. Well, I can turn this knob begin to rotate. Well, I can turn this knob to the left or to the right, and I can get this thing to go faster and faster and faster. This increases the evaporation rate, so that way it will go over to the other side at a much quicker time frame. Okay, so there's one last thing that I have to do. When this flask begins to turn and begins to spin, I need it down in the water bath, don't I? And right now it's just sticking out in the middle of the air. So how on earth do I lower that flask down into that water bath? Well, there's another setting on the instrument, and that setting is going to go back to this piece that my rotator was at. And if you look to the left, there's a button called lift. And that's what that is. Folks, that's the only other button on there. And if you notice, there's an up and a down arrow, and the lift pointed up goes up, the lift pointed down goes down. That's as simple as it is. That's all that you have to do. All right, so as I'm lowering this down, I begin to look at the temperature of my water bath. It's now heated up to 53.3. It still has a way to go. It needs to go up to 95. And if I take a look at my RPM setting, what I finalized the RPM setting on was 165. I felt that that was a good enough rotating number so that way my beaker or my flask would constantly spin and it would increase the surface area and allow this process to happen a little bit faster. So this video is going to show you the lift mechanism so that way you can actually watch this instrument lower that Florence flask down into the water bath. Okay, so the goal is to get my flask that's right now up in the air, turning around into the water bath down below. So how do I do that? Over here to the left-hand side, there's a button that's called the lift, and it's basically the elevator for the flask. I'm just going to slowly hold down the lift button. You're going to see a very noisy elevator and the flask getting lowered inside of my water bath into the vat. All right, so I'm going to keep this in here, and it's going to slowly heat, slowly evaporate. All of the vapor will go from here across through the uh, reflux condenser and down into the receiving flask over here to the left. And guys, what you just saw was the Rotovap at its finest. That's all that this sucker does. And these things can cost $8,000, $10,000 a piece just because of its convenience. You can also hook up a vacuum pump to it. A vacuum pump will increase the pressure so things boil at a lower temperature for you. Uh, so there's a couple of different things that you can do. But at the same time, I also want you to look at the company that makes this Rotovap. It's one of the major companies that are out there on the market. And this company is called Ika. I-K-A. Ika. And ICA is here in Wilmington. So if you are familiar with Laney High School area, you're going to see ICA located at that uh, location. So that is a hub for them. Uh, they do do a little bit of their own testing there. They have a couple of different types of job responsibilities and job roles um, that people are hired on to do at ICA. Uh, but this is a scientific instrumentation company, and it's something that is here in Wilmington at your disposal, at your convenience, and maybe even a possible employer for you, depending on what route you want to go in. All right, so as this begins to heat up, uh, you're going to see the petroleum ether getting distilled off. Uh, I know it's getting distilled off because I'm seeing some droplets that are forming here on the bottom of the condenser. Uh, again, this is a very good news. Uh, you know, here at 53.3, 
then this boiling point range is 40 to 60, then I should be getting quite a bit of petroleum ether, ether off at this point, right? I've cranked this thing up to 95 just to get it hot enough to ensure that everything does come over that is maybe above 60 if the labels lied to me. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I'm starting to see distill it because we're a low boiling point, and it's also one of the reasons that I'm seeing distill it before it's even made it to the 95 degree mark. All right, uh, so I've got a video of it actually distilling, so that way you can see it live. So let me push the play button for you. Okay, at this point I'm seeing my first drips from the Rotovap. Look how fast it's acting and behaving, which is a very good sign. It's working the right way. All right, so drip, drip, drip into the receiving flask that we're going to see below. There we go. So all of that is my reclaimed pet ether that I can reuse for another lab on another date. Folks, that's as simple as it is. That's all the Rotovap really is. A automated, already set up, Simple pot distillation. Okay, so that's all the video is going to show you. Again, very simple. Some of the stuff that we've done over and over throughout the course so far. Uh, here's just another image, maybe a different point of view for the Rotovap. You can see my Florence flask in the hot water bath here. That hot water bath right now is at 81.4. It still hasn't reached 95, but my petroleum ether is coming off, and that's really what I want to see. All right, uh, so here's another view of that process happening. So here I just wanted to give you a bigger view of how this machine is operating. I think that you can see everything in the image now. Uh, so over here to the right hand side is my petroleum ether, my peanut oil that's turning around in the hot water bath. My petroleum ether is getting heated up from that flask. The vapors are getting sent through into the reflux unit that's over here to the left and then drip down into my receiving flask which is there. Again, I have control of the temperature. I also have control of the speed on how fast that rotates. So once more, I just want to say that this water boils at 100. If I dial this up hotter than 100, it will never go and it will never reach that temperature. Uh, once again, though, that's very good news. My petroleum ether has lower boiling points. That's why we can use water in this case. And that's why my ether is going up and over into the receiving flask. I don't really like to use oil because if you can imagine this vat filled with mineral oil or something similar to that, I mean, this is just crazy. It makes a mess. It's very hard to clean. I just hate it. Uh, and in addition to that, but on the outside of the flask as well. So I'm going to continue the collection process. I'm going to get quite a bit of petroleum ether. The majority of that is petroleum ether. And here's a video of me at the end of the process. So up here at the top, you're going to see the time that this process finished. Okay, so my process is finished. The only thing I did was push this button one more time, of course, to turn it off. And that's what you're seeing here. It says off, but keep in mind, it's still hot. All right, so I've raised the elevator. And in raising the elevator, you're seeing that I'm allowing the beaker or the bowling flask, the Florence flask in this case, to spin. And I'm doing this just to get any residual solvent that might be left behind off. And over here to the left-hand side, you see my receiving flask is pretty full, full of liquid. And all of that is petroleum ether that maybe I can reuse future as long as I check it to make sure that it's pretty good. Okay, so a lot of people are pretty depressed when they get to this point, because if you look over here to the right hand side, you're going to see how much oil is left over from that huge flask that was almost full in the very beginning. Uh, if I give you a zoomed in picture of that oil, so you can make your observations, uh, that is what this suck stuff is going to look like, uh, you know. Again, make the observations how you see fit. I'm not going to tell you what I see. You can tell me what you see. That's the whole purpose of your observations and not mine, right? Uh, here's a even closer look at the peanut oil. Uh, so imagine you buying peanut oil in the store. Would this look very similar to that? Yes or no? All right. And then from the bottom, 
this is what we see. So I know that this looks like a little weird kind of perspective, but this really is from the bottom of that flask. And one of the things I do want you to focus in on are these areas right in here. Folks, that is not something wrong with the camera. That is not something that's weird with the flask. These were some type of solid particle that had fell out of solution out of the oil. And I just simply don't know what that is. So because of that, that's not peanut oil. I know it's not peanut oil. And I don't really want to carry that from this point on in the process. Okay, I just I don't feel good about those particles. I don't know what they are. It's not peanut oil, so they should not be a part of this process any further. So what I had to do is I had to go back to the balance and I had to re-tear it out. Okay, so I'm seeing 0, 0.0000 on the screen. And then I'm going to get a mass of that bowling flask with the oil in it. And that's 169.5024. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that those solid little chunky particles are still in there. Whatever those were, I don't know. But they are somewhat contributing to the mass of this sample that I've ended up with. All right? Okay, so now we need to test it. We need to make sure that this is peanut oil. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I go and we have a stock cabinet. And inside of that stock cabinet, we have a container that looks like this. It's Luana peanut oil, straight from the grocery store. It was probably purchased in 1978. I mean, I, I have no clue. But it looks pretty old. And that's okay. But at the same time, I have to keep in mind that this is not fresh peanut oil, and oils do go bad. Oils go rancid. So I didn't have any fresh on hand. I knew we had this container in the lab. I just decided to run this along with my sample just to compare them. So if I do see some differences, that could be one of the reasons. One of the reasons is that this peanut oil has been around for so long that maybe it has changed its composition slightly. So we'll just keep that in mind as we report the data. But this is what I'm going to call the standard as far as peanut oil goes. So the very first test that we're going to do is refractive index. You know how to use the refractive index. We did it with fractionation, right? I'm not going to go through how to use this instrument again. If you need those directions or if you need a refresher on how to use this instrument, then go back to something like the fractionation lab in order to do that. So here's the refractive index instrument. I'm going to first check the peanut oil on the refractive index. So I put a few drops of that peanut oil on my refractive index. I align it up to the center. This is the view field. This is what I see. And then when I flip the button down, here's the meter. So you can write down your readout for the refractive index the way that you need to. All right. So now that we've ran the standard peanut oil on refractive index, I now need to rerun my product. But I need to clean it first. So I clean it off with acetone. This is a really oily substance, so it's going to take a few swipes of the Kim Wipe and the acetone in order to get to that point, in order to make sure that it's completely clean. So once I cleaned off the refractive index, I was ready for my sample. So here's my sample in my little Florence flask, and I'm getting ready to put one or two drops on the refractive index, and this is what I see. All right, so my dividing line's right in the middle. It looks a little fuzzy, but I flip the flipper switch down, and this is the refractive index from the readout. So if this is peanut oil, and if my good oil, my standard quote-unquote, is still good and not rancid, then hopefully these two numbers will be pretty close. All right, so I go back to the tear button of my balance. I re-tear my balance. I then get a match of a watch mass of a watch glass, 33.0615, because guess what, folks? I can't forget about that thimble in the oven, can I? No, that thimble in the oven, I'm drying that thimble out because I had pet ether and stuff on it. My nuts were soaked in the pet ether. I had to dry all of that off. 
we need to get a mass of the dried thimble, cotton, and nuts. And this is the mass of the dried thimble, cotton, and nuts. And that's 50.0174. Keep in mind that I did get little fiber pieces that came off of that membrane because I was trying to remove it with the tweezers and this got pulled off. So I did include that in the mass, but was this the only pieces that were lost? I'm not really sure, but I need to make that note in a lab notebook. Looking through the thimble and the nuts, this is what they ended up looking like in the very end of the process. Again, rep. I see some fibers that are torn from the top. There's one on that side, and here's another small one on this side. I can see that up here at the very top. I'll see that jagged little edge. And I dumped all of the nuts out onto a watch glass, so that way you can at least take a look at what the peanuts looked like in the very end. And this is what they were. Very whitish, chalkyish looking. The picture just really doesn't do it justice. Finally, the other way I'm going to confirm if I have peanut oil or not is with the FTIR. Once more, if you need the directions on how to use the FTIR or why we use it or how it works, you need to go to that particular lab where we introduced it first. And that was probably the fractionation lab. Or not the fractionation, but the ethanol fermentation lab. All right, so the plate on the FTIR, a few drops of my oil. And then I ran the sample. Okay, so as with the directions last time with the FTIR, you know how to use it, you know how to run it. So I'm running my peanut oil. That is what you're seeing on the screen right now. A couple of things that I will say, it looks very good to me. Uh, I, the peanut oil is not going to evaporate on me throughout the run, so I don't have to worry about putting more on the FTIR attachment as I'm running it. But a few of these lines are very traditional with an oil or something that is mainly hydrocarbon based with a few ester groups. Uh, again, you'll know this in another class in the program, don't worry about it yet. But after this runs, I'm going to database search it and I'm gonna cross reference it to see if it does give me an oil. The thing here is that peanut oil is very hard to distinguish between another type of oil because they have such similar characteristics. Uh, so if it comes up in oil, I'll be very happy and that's really all that I'm after. Uh, I'll do the same thing with the stock peanut oil as well. Uh, but here you see the ATR attachment. The ATR attachment has a few drops of liquid onto, my, onto the plate uh, that's there at the very top. Right now, this is my sample, so this is what's coming from my flask, but I'm also going to run the Luana Pure Peanut Oil as well to see if I can get a difference between the two. Uh, so we ran it with Refractive Index, and we'll do the same thing with FTIR. All right, so folks, there's the FTIR running up and going with my peanut oil at play, hopefully. So after about a minute and a half, I ended up getting my FTIR. And this is what the FTIR ended up looking like. All right, just like what we saw on the screen. Again, just a series of lines. You have no clue what this is, and that's fine. I'm not asking you to know what that means. But I need to be able to database search it. I need to figure out what's there, right? Okay, so in this video, we're going to database search it together, and we'll see what pops up. Okay, so the peanut oil is now finished, and the only thing that I have to do at this point is to cross-reference it. So up here at the top, I'm going to hit search, and then over here to the left-hand side toward the bottom, I'm going to hit spectrum search, and when I do that, a confirmation box pop up on the screen. It's going to cross-reference the database. And if I go in and take a look at the top choice, folks, let me give it some time to zoom in and focus. I see olive oil, but I also see sesame oil and butter and margarine and olive oil and butter and cooking oil. So all of these are very oily and I'm very happy with this. It probably was not going to give me peanut oil, but olive oil is very close. So I'm going to run the pure peanut oil from Luana. I'm assuming it's pure peanut oil. And then we'll see what that gives us. 
All right, folks, so you're going to find those FTIR reports in the Blackboard uh, folder, and you can print those reports off for the Luana oil as well as my product oil, and you can compare those two to see if they're similar or if you think they're the same. But that really does wrap us up for the Soxalate extraction. That's all there was to it. So I had to put some crushed up peanuts into a thimble. I had to let this run for about three days. And that thimble held all of my nuts for those three days. And it allowed the solvents to extract. And all of the peanut oil came out in the very end. We put it in a rotovap. We distilled all of that solvent off. We were left with our peanut oil in the very end that we tested on a refractive index and on an FTIR instrument. So, not very complicated, not a lot of steps, not a lot of reagents. It was just a lot of waiting, and that's the problem with the Soxalate. All right, so good luck with the lab notebook. I think that's all of the information that you need to write a really good lab entry. And it's also the calculations and the numbers that come along with it as well. That probably is going to take you a little bit longer just because there were quite a few different balance masses and stuff that we have to worry with here. So you'll end up with a direct percentage of peanuts. You'll end up with an indirect percentage of peanuts. Keep in mind the size of the nut chopped pieces play a factor in how much oil we get out. The length of time plays a factor in how much oil we get out. And my boo-boo with the tweezers and the ripping of the thimble is also going to play a factor in the amount of percentage that we will report from our laboratory data. Okay, so good luck. As always, if you have questions, you know how to get a hold of me. And that's the Soxalate of the Peanuts. It's a wrap. Maybe a candy bar wrap. <laughs>